my voice. Good to see everybody out here this evening. As you can see on the screen, this is sort of a continuation of the lesson we had this morning on self-control. And I thought it'd be a good time then, if I'm dealing with self-control, to deal with another aspect of that. And so I want to look at the theme, as you see on the screen, of that of gambling. And we're going to ask and answer, hopefully, the question, is gambling a sin? A lot of things, a lot of industry is built around material desire. And, of course, that's one of those things which says lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Those three elements tug at us in in ways that may not uh, immediately be sinful in and of itself, uh, but leads to sin. That kind of pulls us into a sinful activity. Gambling is one of those things that plays on our desire for more at an easy, uh, in an easy way. Thank you very much. You I could count on. Let me give you some, some rundown, just some quick facts about this, why it's a serious matter that we need to address. Gambling it has generated more revenue than movies. Spectator sports, theme parks, cruise ships, and recorded music combined. Think about that. And we are really infatuated, it seems, with a lot of those things, like sports, uh, music, those things. But gambling, that, that which uh, is, that we'll be discussing in this lesson this evening, has generated more uh, revenue then all of those things combined. You're not paying for a commodity. You're paying because somebody covets and somebody wants something and they're willing to wager something that they might uh, win the jackpot, the, the prize. And so it's playing on. It's kind of like a lot of industries play on the appeal to the flesh like we talked about this morning a little bit. Lust of the flesh, uh, uh, liquor industry playing on the lust of the eye and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. We're looking at those things and we see how people get pulled into those things and then become addicted to those things. A uh, lot of money is generated by playing on lust. The pornography, that's a huge industry that plays on the weakness of a man's lust. And uh, yes, women too fall into that. And so it is playing, it's generating money by playing on somebody's weakness. Somebody having a, a weakness there, somebody's going to cash in on it. Now I know that I, can, I can count on people being weak enough to want something for nothing. And so we'll cash in on that desire uh, because they will, have, they will do it over and over again thinking that one day my luck will be there and I will win. So gambling is, because of that, has generated more revenue than all the other industries combined. There are 10 million more addicts to gambling than there are alcoholics. So when we talk about the number of alcoholics is staggering, the number of gamblers is more than that. And I'm not talking about just alcoholics, but I'm talking about those who are addicted to some substance. Legal gambling is a $40 billion per year industry in the United States alone. There are, uh, is twice, a mu- uh, twice as much than what the U.S. spends on automobiles and public education. Twice as much as that. More than the combined profits of U.S. Steel, General Motors, and GE. Uh, People that make $10,000 or less spend more on gambling than any other group. Why? Because they're hoping to cash in that one chance, that one opportunity that they can hit it big. And they're tired of of, uh, the low means of living that they... But they're not tired enough to be frugal with their, their money. They're, they're willing to take a risk just for the big chance that the big chance might come along. 
And so it cashes in or it plays on the lust for material things. And so let's understand what we're talking about when we talk about this issue. If we understand it correctly, we will see some things in it that put, that raise a red flag. And they should. We must understand the definition of it. A lot of people say, well, you know, I, I saw where, where they cast lots in the Bible. And they're thinking that they were, that's gambling. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about any kind of, uh, of risk or any kind of means of gaining uh, information or decision making. We're not talking about that kind of thing. And so we need to define gambling as any, it is not just anything that involves some kind of chance. If you, if you uh, look at it as just taking a risk, and that's all you've got in mind, then you're going to fall short in understanding what is the central issue here. A lot of times people say, you know, when we walk out the door, we're taking a risk. Yeah, and when you get out of the bed in the morning, and if you stay in the bed, it doesn't matter what you do, you're taking some kind of risk. Life is not a gamble. There are risks, but risks and gambling are not, this, are not synonymous. Gambling involves chance, all right. But it is not all that's involved in it. There's a lot of, uh, that, that definition is just incomplete if you're thinking it's just taking a chance. It's more than that. Webster's defines it this way. To play a game for money or property. To bet on an uncertain outcome. It is to wager some money on an uncertain event. The uncertain event is uncertain whether or not you wager money on it or not. And so it is still risky, and it's still going to involve a chance, but you haven't wagered on everything. There's a chance. We don't wager on everything. We don't put money down hoping to gain somebody else's money based on the fact that the risk is involved. I mean, that... It, that we're just going to take a risk and we're going to put some money on it because of that. Every risk is not gambling. Gamblers usually bet money on something else of value and put that at stake. They put that money at stake. I'm liable to lose this. In fact, the chances are greater that I will lose this money than that I will gain the greater uh, uh, stake at the end. So the outcome, we settle on the, the outcome of whatever chance it is. It can be a football game. It can be a card game. It can be a basketball game. It can be a baseball game. It can be horse racing. It can be dog racing. It can be a roulette table. The chance that you're taking uh, Depends on what game you're talking about. And there are lots of risks involved. But the risk is not itself gambling. The wagering is what we're talking about. So there are certain elements. Get this clear in our, in our minds. There are certain elements that are always involved in gambling. And you can't pull any one of those things out and it be gambling. One of those things, of course, as we mentioned, is the event itself. You can, you can wager and you can bet on any kind of event. And, of course, at the start of it, it's uncertain how it's really going to work out. The event itself can be any number of things. It doesn't matter what it is. But there will always be a chance, an uncertain outcome of an event. But that's not all that's involved in gambling. The second thing, of course, that's got to be in place is a wager or a stake, a placing of something of value based on your prediction of the outcome of that event and that you're willing to wager this, to place it on the table, so to speak, anything of value that you agree on beforehand and say, I'm hoping I'll get what you put on the table, and you're hoping that, I'll get, that you'll get what I put on the table. The event, of course, it doesn't matter what it is. 
card games races. The third thing, of course, is that in gambling there is a winner that celebrates at the end, and then there's a loser. Now, those are not big issues. Of course, those are the obvious. If you take out the stakes, you'll still have an event, and you'll still have winners and losers. But the thing that makes gambling what it is, is that it is, it is betting and putting at stake, wagering something of value for something that is uncertain. And at the cost and at the expense of other people who are wanting to win that particular wager. So uh, let's look at those elements now and compare them to some other things. Gambling is not uh, just those things, but let's, it involves those things, but it's not just a risk and it's not something like, well, farmers take a risk. They, they plant and they're hoping things will work out. They work, though, and they're working for a, a, an event, and they're, putting, they're investing uh, something in hopes that the climate and whatever the, uh, will happen. They're not wagering, and there's not winners and losers. Everybody either wins or everybody loses in the, that particular case. Some people think that buying and selling stocks, that that's gambling. Buying stocks, of course, is just saying I'm buying, I'm buying a, a piece of the company. We're all hoping the company does well so that all of us benefit. All of us are going to benefit if the company does well. We're hoping that it does. Nobody is wagering anything. It is buying something. It is placing uh, an interest in something, placing a share, taking a share of something and, and, and trying to be responsible with that share. But you're not do, doing that at the, at the hopes that somebody else is going to lose. You're doing that in the hopes that everybody in this company that has a share in that is going to benefit. And we're all going to do well together by having a share in that. So buying and selling stocks might involve risk just like farming. But you're not wagering on that, and you're not hoping that somebody loses so that you can win. Some people think that uh, starting a business is risky business. (laughs) It it is, but that's normal. Everything everything, uh, has a risk involved in it. Starting a business is risky, but you're not wagering on it, and you're not hoping somebody loses so that you can benefit by their mistake. Some people think insurance is gambling. No, insurance is just buying protection, buying protection for a time. You're buying that protection so that if something does happen, this company says, I will, we will step in and, and, and take care of that. That's not gambling. That's not wagering, hoping that, the, uh, that somebody loses and somebody else wins. Door prizes. Sometimes people think that if you have a door prize, that's gambling. Now, there's a chance that you can win a door prize, but door prizes are not in and of themselves uh, gambling. Making decisions by drawing straws or flipping a coin. Yeah, there's a chance involved, but nobody's wagering, hoping somebody loses and somebody wins in the case that they wagered something to that end so that that uh, good result will result in somebody else losing so gambling involves some things that are similar to other things, but not, they're not identical. So what's the real issue? When we're talking about this particular issue, we're risking what is yours to gain what is another, while we're all exploiting the fact that we're being covetous. That we're wanting what belongs to another, that they work for that, and they're being covetous, hoping that they'll get what's ours. Everybody is playing on the hopes that their covetousness wins for them. You see, covetousness is material interest and wanting what does not lawfully belong to you. What does not belong to you, and you want it, and you're willing to risk what's another, even the welfare of other people. As I said a while ago, here in most of the gambling situations in this country, 
it's usually those who are economically poor who are hoping to get out of their poverty. And so they're risking because they have a covetous interest. Some of that interest, of course, is pulling so strongly at them that they're putting themselves in further poverty. Children are not eating because daddy took the money that we were going to use to buy food this week. And they can't buy it because daddy was there at the gambling casino or whatever the the event was, wagering, hoping that he could cash in on somebody else's covetousness. It's risking what's yours to gain another's while exploiting everybody in that group. In other words, it is a fellowship, a partnership of the covetous. And it plays on that covetousness. It has everything to do with the goal and the purpose that is involved and not necessarily the size of the purse. So you can start out with little bitty uh, things and then just kind of add on to it. It's kind of like taking just a little bit of alcohol and you play on that and you say, well, I was able to handle that. And then you just take a little bit more and you say, well, I was able to handle that. And what is involved in covetousness is that you're hoping to gain at somebody else's covetousness. And you're hoping that their covetousness allows you to win what they really wish they didn't lose. But they're willing to place it at stake. Well, that's kind of like, it's kind of like another thing that I think that we can see. Here's a group of kids. They're teenagers. And one of them has a revolver, a gun. And they want to play this game called Russian roulette. And what you do is you put one bullet in the chamber and you spin it. And then you say, now place the gun to your head. Of course, everybody that's foolish enough to do that, there's a chance you'll blow your brains out. Is a chance. Now, you might say, well, if they're that foolish, they should, uh, that should happen. Well, yeah, that plays on hatred for one another. That means that you don't value life. And so it's playing on the devaluing of another, li- of another life. If, if you value somebody, you won't play that game. <laughs> You won't involve yourself in that game. You won't take that kind of risk so that just for the sake of taking a risk. So Russian roulette is a game that is, of course, a very foolish game. It might end that somebody blows the brains out. And everybody agreed to play that game, though. Yeah, they did. But they were all foolish. And somebody was trying to be prideful. It played on the pride of life. Played on that. And it wound up killing somebody. Now, who's responsible? Well, he's responsible, and the whole group is responsible. Everybody was involved in murder in that particular case. Everybody agreed to a murderous act. You can call it what you want, but it is murder. Nonetheless, everybody's playing the game of possible murder. Same thing would be so if you're talking about dueling. Here are two men who are saying that we're willing to take a risk. I believe that I can, I can shoot you before you shoot me. And so they both pace out 10 paces and they turn around and they see who can, who's on target and who's not, who's the quickest and who's not. And one of them dies. Maybe sometimes both of them shoot at the same time and both of them die. But both of them have played a game with life. Both of them wagered life just for the sake of the pride of saying, I won. Both of them took a risk with each other's life. Both of them took a risk that meant that, meant that I don't value your life and I hope I kill you. I hope you don't kill me. That's the, that's the kind of game that is played in dueling, the chance that you can play on somebody else's pride And that you can play on their hatred for human life. And so you're cashing in. You're playing that game. But what's the end result? Well, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's still murder. It might be murder by consent. 
That is, both of them consented to it, though. Yeah, they agreed to it ahead of time. Both of them consented to it. That doesn't mean that it's anything less than hatred for that person's life. If you valued that person's life, you would not even take such a chance with that person's life. And so the golden rule is that you are to love your neighbor as yourself. That would mean that you would not do anything to risk yourself, and so you're not going to risk your neighbor's life as well. Now, when you're talking about cashing in on somebody else's foolishness, dueling, and Russian roulette, those are games that you play on somebody else's foolishness, hoping that you cash in, that you come out the winner on that. So what is wrong with gambling? Gambling is covetousness. It is playing on somebody else's covetousness, hoping that you win what they don't really want to lose. They don't want to give you that. They're doing, you're just, you're just cashing in on the fact that they were just as foolish as you were. Just as the two duelers or the game of Russian roulette, all of them were foolish, every one of them. But they were playing on each other's foolishness to the objective end of something coming out in it that was uh, in their favor. Covetousness is being eager for more especially what belongs to another. If somebody doesn't want to give you something out of their pocket, but they're hoping to take a risk to win what's in your pocket, that's covetousness. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I want you to notice with me how important this issue is in the context of of morality. He starts out in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians and he talks about a church and this church this church is being uh, insensitive to their responsibility to a brother who has his father's wife. And so sexual immorality everybody is turning their turning away and trying to not to make any issue there. And the issue is already there. And it's already infiltrating the church. It's already permeating like a leaven. And it's changing people's outlook. And it's changing people's value system. And it's making people who ought to be together on morality. It's making them compromise their morality. Now, notice with me as after he gets on to them for this kind of nonchalant, look the other way kind of attitude... He says this in chapter 5, verse 9, that I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world. I mean, we expect that of the world. And so we can't leave the world and, and get out of a world where there's sexual immorality going on. But notice his next phrase. Or with the covetous. How would you detect if somebody is covetous? Well, I, it, 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 that one is a hard one to detect. Unless they say something. Or unless they do something that gives it away. Well, wouldn't gambling be one of those giveaway things that says they're trying to cash in on somebody else's covetousness? They're hoping that their covetousness wins out this time and that the others lose. And it doesn't matter if the children in that household gets fed or not. I won't watch their, their wagering. Well, he says you ought, not to, you ought not have fellowship with the covetous. And there are just a few ways that I can think of that you can express covetousness. It's not the fact that you have something, but it's the fact that you value it so highly. So highly that you don't care what happens to other people. Extortioners. Well, extortioners, of course, are trying to get something by extorting it from somebody else. Well, those two words, extortion and covetousness, play into this idea of wagering so that you can gain from somebody else's covetousness 
And you just become the covetous one that wins this particular prize. Or idolaters. And in the reading just a moment ago in Colossians chapter 3, you remember Paul saying that covetousness is idolatry. It's making material things into an idol. You're, you're willing to submit everything, all of your values to those things. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, he mentions that again. Now, over and over he says, these are issues that are to be dealt with in the church, in the congregation, but more importantly in yourself, in the individual. In chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, idolaters captivates that word uh, covetous, but it's going to come up again. Idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves. And look at the thief is taking something from somebody else. Oh yeah, but they're taking it by, by consent. Yeah, everybody's taking it by consent. Just like dueling is... Gambling with somebody's life is taking a risk with somebody else's life, but both parties are consenting to it. Russian roulette, where everybody's consenting to it, but everybody's acting foolish. Thieves are covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's how important this is, that we don't want to miss going to heaven. But we could... And we will if we are covetous and if we're trying to get something from somebody else that they don't really want to give us. They're not trying to give us that. They're trying to play on our covetousness. So it violates the principle of covetousness. It violates the principle of the golden rule in loving your neighbor as yourself because if you love your neighbor as yourself, you do not want to take advantage of their weakness. And the weakness that they have in this case is covetousness. And you don't want to take advantage of that because they really don't want to give you this. They're risking it and hope that they get what's yours. You see, it violates the principle on their part and on our part if we played the game to try to win what was theirs. It really is a matter of selfishness. Galatians chapter six, uh, 5 talks about the works of the flesh and, and then the works that are of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. One of the things that he mentions in Galatians chapter 5 verse uh, 19 beginning is that those who do such things, he says will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he mentions, among the certain things that he's mentioned, he mentions hatred. He mentions contentions. He mentions jealousies, that is, jealous of what another person has. Selfish ambitions. What is the ambitions that are involved at the gambling joint? Whatever it is, it's not a charity. It's not a case where I'm saying, I'm trying to give you something. I want to give you something. No, it's selfish ambitions. They're all like, they're on the table. Uh, then he goes on to talk about revelries and the like, of which I've told you beforehand. Anything like it, anything that plays on those things. He says, if I've told you this before, if you practice those things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And like I said just a moment ago, it's really taking from somebody what they don't want to give you. It's theft. Only one takes the property, but they take it by stealth. They just happen to win in this particular case. The Christian looks at it this way. Ephesians 4.28 says that you are to labor with your hands what is good. And then he says not only just for yourself, but you're to labor so that you'll have something to give to him who has need. So if you're wanting to do good, just give somebody something. Don't, don't risk involving yourself in a game that will upset the majority of those, take away from the majority, all of them playing on the 
level of covetousness, wanting for themselves and selfish ambition being involved, this is a, a chance if you want to do good to somebody, just reach in your pocket and give it to them. But don't play a game that plays on everybody's covetousness. And don't risk what is yours for the sake of winning something that belongs to somebody else. It, 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 it violates the legitimate means of transfer of money or property by means of labor. That really the only things that we can see in the Bible are uh, you can get something by working. Or you can exchange something for something. Or you can give something to some, somebody. But playing on somebody's covetousness, that's not an option. You see, that's what is involved in gambling. It, it violates the principle of good stewardship. Anybody that's a good steward is not going to wager thinking, well, I know the family needs this to, to pay the bills, and I know that we need this to put food on the table, but there's a chance that I can get a lot of money if I put this money on the table. Well, that's not good stewardship because the chance is greater that you'll lose it. Sometimes the chance is astronomical that you'll lose it. And so good stewardship says, I'm going to work what is honorable with my hands so that I may have to provide for my own. And then I'm going to do what I can to help those who are in need. And so we're trying to give and try to be givers instead of takers. It violates that principle of good stewardship. And that principle of stewardship is stressed throughout the New Testament. Gambling is addictive. Paul says, I'm not going to, even if it was lawful. And there are some things, of course, that are lawful in and of themselves. There are a lot of things that are not lawful. But, he, but even if everything was lawful, even if we could say it's lawful to gamble, it's not expedient. Not even helpful because, number one, it, there's more harm and more hurt and more pain involved for somebody else. And it's addictive. And Paul says, even if everything was lawful, everything is not helpful and I will not be brought under the power of anything. And the covetousness is an addiction. Covetousness, of course, is always involved in in gambling. Gambling is directly connected with many evils. Why is it that organized crime is so prevalently, so commonly connected with gambling? Drinking and theft and murder and prostitution and drugs and broken homes seem to be attached. And Jesus says, when you look at a tree, and the tree on it is, uh, and the fruit on it is not good, that ought to tell you something. If the tree is bearing bad fruit, then that's not a good tree. And if you're looking at the tree of the gambling industry, that's not a good thing. The fruit on it is not good. And so I can just you know, talk about those particular things and, and illustrate that over and over that you should look at the tree and see. How does this work out? How does this work out for the average person who puts money on the table hoping that they'll be the winners? Well, it usually works out the opposite. There are more losers than winners. And those who win lose. Why? Because they played on covetousness, taking from others, not in a not in an honorable way. So when you look at all of that and we ask and answer the question, is it a sin? I look at the fruit on that tree and I say, absolutely. Again, it's not taking risks. It's wagering on those risks, hoping to get what belongs to another, hoping to, to get what somebody else is playing because of their own covetousness. It is a game that plays on covetousness. And thus, it shows what's in the heart. It shows covetousness. Well, those are things that we need to know because, number one, I'm serving Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to serve Him with great honor. 
And if Jesus says, don't even do anything like that, don't even play up to it, don't, don't play with fire, and don't, don't do things that are dangerous, and don't get yourself close to the fire so that you could be burned, or that you might be burning other people. Jesus tells us how to live a holy life, and that's what we're interested in. We're interested in everybody gaining, everybody going to heaven, and there's no game involved here. This is, this is seriousness. This is life. And I hope this, this evening, if you've never obeyed the gospel, that you can, you'll think about it. You'll think about Jesus Christ. Let him be the Lord of your life. And then try to live your life in harmony with his will. If you've never gotten started with that, and we can help you. If you'd like to make your uh, confession tonight and we can help you with that, please come now.